how an idea built a fortune because of the need for faith and cooperation in operating business and industry. It will be both interesting and profitable to analyze an event which provides an excellent understanding of the method by which industrialists and businessmen accumulate great fortunes by giving before they try to get. The event chosen for this illustration dates back to 1900 when the United States Steel Corporation was being formed as you read the story. Keep in mind these fundamental facts and you will understand how ideas have been converted into huge fortunes. If you are one of those who have often wondered how great fortunes are accumulated, the story of the creation of the United States Steel Corporation will be enlightening. And if you have any doubt that men can think and grow rich, this story should dispel that doubt because you can plainly see in the story of the United States Steel the application of a major portion of the principles described in this book. This astounding description of the power of an idea was dramatically told by John Lowell, L-O-W-E-L-L, -L, and the New York World Telegram, with whose courtesy it is here reprinted. Here we go. A pretty, a pretty after-dinner speech for a billion dollars. Sounds kind of corny, but a pretty, like pretty, you know, a pretty after-dinner speech for a billion dollars. When, on the evening of December 12th, 1900, some 80 of the nation's financial nobility gathered in the banquet hall of the university club on Fifth Avenue to do honor to a young man from out of the West. Not half a dozen of the guests realized they were to witness the most significant episode in American industrial history. J. Edward Simmons and Charles Stuart Smith, their hearts full of gratitude for the lavish hospitality bestowed on them by Charles M. Schwab, during a recent visit to Pittsburgh, had arranged the dinner to introduce the 38-year-old steel man to Eastern Bank Society, but they didn't expect him to stampede the convention. They warned him, in fact, that the bosoms within New York stuffed shirts would not be responsive to oratory, and that if he didn't want to bore the Stillmans and Harrymans and Vanderbilts, he had better limit himself to 15 or 20 minutes of polite vaporings and let it go at that. So they didn't really want him to talk too much, pretty much. So look at, who were, these, who were the Stillmans and the Harrymans and Vanderbilts? <laughs> Even John Pierpont Morgan, sitting on the right hand of Schwab, as became his imperial dignity, intended to grace the banquet table with his presence only briefly. And so far as the press and public were concerned, the whole affair was of so little moment that no mention of it found its way into print the next day. So the two hosts and their distinguished guests ate their way through the usual seven or eight courses. There was little conversation and what there was of it was restrained. Few of the bankers and brokers had met Schwab whose career had flowered along the banks of the Mon, the Monongahela, M-O-N-O-N-G-A-H-E-L-A, -E and none knew him well. But before the evening was over, they, and with them, Money Master Morgan were to be swept off their feet in a billion dollar baby. The United States Steel Corporation was to be conceived. It is perhaps unfortunate for the sake of history that no record of Charlie Schwab's speech at the dinner was ever made. It is probable, however, that it was a homely speech, somewhat ungrammatical, for the niceties of language never bothered Schwab. Full of epigram and threaded with wit, but aside from that, it had a galvanic force and the effect upon the five billions of estimated capital that was represented by the diners. After it was over and the gathering was still under its spell, although Schwab had talked for 90 minutes, oh shit, Morgan led the orator to a recessed window where, dangling their legs from the high, uncomfortable seat, they talked for an hour or more. The magic, of, uh, the magic of the Schwab personality had been turned on full force, but what was more important and lasting was a full-fledged, clear-cut program he laid down for the, for the aggrandizement, A-G-G-R-A-N-D-I-Z-E-M-E-N-T, laid down for the aggrandizement of steel. Many other men had tried to interest Morgan in slapping together a steel trust after the pattern of the biscuit wire and hoop, sugar, rubber, whiskey, oil, or chewing gum combinations. John W. Gates, the gambler, had urged it, but Morgan distrusted him. The Moore Boys, Bill and Jim, Chicago stock jobbers, who had glued together a match trust and a cracker corporation, had urged it and failed. Albert H. Gary, 
The sanctimonious country lawyer wanted to foster it, but he wasn't big enough to be impressive until Schwab's eloquence took J.P. Morgan to the heights from which he could visualize the solid results of the most daring financial undertaking ever conceived. The project was regarded as a delirious dream of easy money crackpots. The financial magnetism that began a generation ago to attract thousands of small and sometimes inefficiently managed companies into large and competition-crushing combinations had become operative in the still world through the devices of that jovial business pirate, John W. Gates. Gates already had formed the American Steel and Wire Company out of a chain of small concerns, and together with Morgan had created the Federal Steel Company. But by the side of Andrew Carnegie's gigantic vertical trust, a trust owned and operated by 53 partners, those other combinations were Picayune, P-I-C-A-Y-U-N-E. They might combine to the heart's content, but the whole lot of them couldn't make a dent in the Carnegie organization, and Morgan knew it. The eccentric old Scott knew it too from the magnificent heights of Skibble Castle he had viewed first with amusement and then with resentment the attempts of Morgan's smaller companies to cut into his business. When the attempts became too bold, Carnegie's temper was translated into anger and retaliation. He decided to duplicate every mill owned by his rivals. Hitherto, he hadn't been interested in wire, pipe, hoops, or sheet. Instead, he was content to sell such companies the raw steel and let them work it into whatever shape they wanted. Now, with Schwab as his chief and able lieutenant, he planned to drive his enemies to the wall. So it was so it was that in the speech of Charles M. Schwab, Morgan saw the answer to his problem of combination. A trust without Carnegie, giant of them all, would be no trust at all. A plum pudding, as one writer said, without the plums. Schwab's speech on the night of December 12, 1900, undoubtedly carried the in inference, though not the pledge, that the vast Carnegie enterprise could be brought under the Morgan tent. He talked of the world future for steel, of reorganization for efficiency, of specialization, of the scraping of unsuccessful mills and concentration of effort on the flourishing properties of economies in the ore traffic of economies in overhead and administrative departments of capturing foreign markets. More than that, he told the buccaneers among them wherein lay, wherein lay the errors of their customary piracy. Okay, wait, wait. This is a long chapter, so it's... Excuse me. More than that, he told the buccaneers among them wherein lay the errors of their customary piracy. Their purposes, he inferred, had been to create monopolies, raise prices, and pay themselves fat dividends out of privilege. Schwab condemned the system in his heartiest manner. The short-sightedness of such a policy, he told his hearers, lay in the fact that it restricted the market in an era when everything cried for expansion. By cheapening the cost of steel, he argued, an ever-expanding market would be created. More uses for steel will be devised and a goodly portion of the world trade could be captured. <coughs> Actually, though he did not know it, Schwab was an apostle of modern mass production. So the dinner at the university club came to an end. Morgan went home to think about Schwab's rosy predictions. Schwab went back to Pittsburgh to run the steel business for we Andrew Carnegie, while Gary and the rest went back to their stock tickers to fiddle around in anticipation of the next move. It was not long coming. It took Morgan about one week to digest the feast of reason Schwab had placed before him. When he had assured himself that no financial indigestion was to result, he sent for Schwab and found that young man rather coy. Mr. Carnegie, Schwab indicated, might not like it if he found his trusted company president had been flirting with the Emperor of Wall Street, the street upon which Carnegie was resolved never to tread. Then it was suggested by John W. Gates, the go-between that if Schwab happened to be in Bellevue Hotel in Philadelphia, J.P. Morgan might also happen to be there. When Schwab arrived, however, Morgan was inconveniently ill at his New York home, and so, on the elder man's pressing invitation, Schwab went to New York and presented himself at the door of the financier's library. Now, certain economic historians have professed that belief that from the beginning to the end of the drama, the stage was set by Andrew Carnegie that the dinner to Schwab, the famous speech, the Sunday night conference between Schwab and the Money King were events arranged by the canny Scott. The truth is exactly the opposite. When Schwab was called in to consummate the deal, he didn't even know whether the little boss, as Andrew was called, would so much as listen to an offer to, to sell. 
particularly to a group of men whom Andrew regarded as being endowed with something less than holiness. Okay, so, uh, particularly to a group of men whom Andrew Carnegie regarded as being endowed with something less than holiness. But Schwab did take into the conference with him in his own handwriting six sheets of copper plate figures representing to his mind the physical worth and the potential earning capacity of every steel company he regarded as an essential uh, star in the new metal firmament, firmament. Four men pondered over these figures all night. The chief, of course, was Morgan, steadfast in his belief in the divine right of money. With him, with him was his aristocratic partner, Robert Bacon, a scholar and gentleman. The third was John W. Gates, whom Morgan scorned as a gambler and used as a tool. The fourth was Schwab, who knew more about the process of making and selling steel than any whole group of men then living. Throughout that conference, the Pittsburghers' figures were never questioned. If he said a company was worth so much, then it was worth that much and no more. He was insistent, too, upon including in the combination only those concerned he nominated. He had conceived a corporation in which there would be no duplication not even to satisfy the greed of friends who wanted to unload their companies upon the broad Morgan's shoulders. When dawn came, Morgan rose and straightened his back. Only one question remained. Do you think you can persuade Andrew Carnegie to sell? He asked. I can try, said Schwab. Schwab. If you can get him to sell, I will undertake the matter, said Morgan. So far, so good, but will Carnegie sell? How much would he demand? Schwab thought about 320 million. What would he take payment in, common or preferred stocks, bonds, cash? Nobody could raise a third of a billion dollars in cash. There was a golf game in January on the frost-cracking heat of the St. Andrew's Links in Westchester with Andrew bundled up in sweaters against the cold and Charlie talking volubly as usual to keep his spirits up. But no word of business was mentioned until the pair sat down in the cozy warmth of the Carnegie Cottage nearby. <coughs> then with the same persuasiveness that have had, that had hypnotized 80 millionaires at the university club, Schwab poured out the glittering promises of retirement and comfort of untold millions to satisfy the old man's social caprices. Carnegie capitulated, wrote a figure on a slip of paper, handed it to Schwab and said, all right, that's what we'll sell for. The figure was approximately 400 million and was reached by taking the 320 million mentioned by Schwab as a basic figure and adding to it 80 million to represent the increased capital value over the previous two years. Later, on the deck of, an, of a transatlantic liner, the Scotsman said ruefully to Morgan, I wish I had asked you for a hundred million more. Later, on the deck of a transat... Okay, okay, so... Later, on the deck of a transatlantic liner, the Scotsman said ruefully to Morgan, I wish I had asked you for a hundred million more. Said to Ruf ruefully ruefully to Morgan <coughs> Charles Schwab if you had asked for it you'd have gotten it Morgan told him cheerfully there was an uproar of course a British correspondent cabled that the foreign still world was appalled by the gigantic combination President Hadley of Yale declared that unless trusts were regulated the country might expect an emperor in Washington within the next 25 years but that able stock manipulator Keene went at his work of shoving the New York stock at the public so vigorously that all the excess water estimated by some at nearly 600 million was absorbed in a twinkling. So Carnegie had his millions and the Morgan syndicate had 62 million for all the trouble and all the boys from Gates to Gary had their millions. The 38 year old Schwab had his reward. He was made president of the new corporation and remained in control until 1930.